Bare navn. So first of all, what we know is that the multi-resolution analysis is generated just by the choice of a suitable function five. This is the first statement we have. So a multi-resolution analysis is fully determined by what I would call a suitable choice for the function phi. And what we also know now is that as soon as we have this function phi in our hands, we can construct the wavelet. So the way we are doing that is exactly as I described in the first part of the lecture. We start with the function phi, and then we construct the function h0. And then after we have the function h0, we find the function h1. And when we have the function h1, we can, con we can construct the function psi. So do you think we have completed the program now? Or is there something in the wavelet analysis that we still need to analyze? In other words, are you happy with these two statements? You say we have the problem about how to find phi, and this is exactly what I wanted to hear. If you look at the definition of the multi-resolution analysis, so we have it here again. We just know that all the conditions that are stated here, they are given just by a good choice of the function phi, but we don't know how to take good functions phi such that the last condition is satisfied and the spaces we are dealing with also satisfies the first conditions. So the question is, how can we choose phi? So we don't know anything about that yet. Instead of writing down a long statement, I will just show to you how we can formulate suitable conditions. And this is actually a theorem that you worked with already last week. So you know the statement that, that I show you now. This is the theorem 8211. And what it says is that we have to pick a function phi, and it has to satisfy the three conditions that are written down here. So let's go just discuss what the conditions say. Let's start with the second condition. You see, what I already showed you is that if we have a multi-resolution analysis, then the function phi satisfies this relationship I showed you with the function h0. Namely, that the Fourier transform of phi evaluated 2 gamma is the same as the function h0 of gamma times the Fourier transform of phi. <laughs> and what you see here is that this is put as one of the conditions in the theorem. So we have to choose the function phi such that this condition is satisfied. This is the first condition. The second condition is that when we look at the translates of phi, then this needs to form an orthonormal system. So we need to take inner products of the elements tk5 with other elements t, t, j, phi, and then show that we get the same if k is equal to j, and otherwise we get zero. So we know these two conditions very well. The third one is the only one that is somehow new to us, and it says that if you look at the Fourier transform of phi, then in a small neighborhood around zero, in a small epsilon neighborhood around zero, then this function has to take uh, for values that are away from zero. So what the first condition says, inf of gamma belonging to an interval minus epsilon epsilon of phi hat of gamma should be positive. What this condition means 
is that if you make a graph of the function phi hat of gamma in absolute value, then this function is not allowed to go close to the point zero comma zero. So around the variable gamma equal to zero, it has to take values that are not equal to zero. So it has to, to be something that goes like this. Or it can do anything it wants. It is just not allowed to get close to the point zero comma zero. So whenever the, gap, the variable is close to zero, the function has to stay away from zero. And this is something you can easily check because you simply calculate the Fourier transform of your function. You look at the absolute value and you see how the function behaves close to, to gamma equal to zero. So in practice, this is actually an easy condition to check. So if all these conditions are satisfied, then we know that the function phi will generate a multi-resolution analysis. That means now we are here and then we can construct the wavelet by, by this procedure that is formulated here. So the answer is just, we have the question here, the answer is we look at theorem 8 to 11. So this is something we can do. Now, instead of going more into details with that, I will speak a little bit about applications of wavelets. And we will not be able to finish that today because there are some mathematical steps we need to take before we can actually reach the actual uh, applications. But I'll at least take all the mathematical steps that are needed such that at the beginning of the next lecture, you can see how wavelets can be applied. So let's see how far we can go today. So what do we know so far? So we know now how to construct a wavelet. So we know a construction of a wavelet. That means we know how to construct an orthonormal basis. So the orthonormal basis d to the power j t k psi. The interesting thing is we worked very hard to construct that orthonormal basis, but in applications, we are not really dealing with this orthonormal basis. We're dealing with another orthonormal basis. So in practice, we will use another orthonormal basis that actually comes out from the same construction, and I'll show you the slide, Lee, in, in just a, a minute. But in practice, we are using another orthonormal basis. And the orthonormal basis we will look at is sort of modification of what we are looking at here. So we will still look at the scaled and translates version of the function psi. So we still look at d to the power j c k psi, but instead of letting j run through all the integers, we will just let j run through all the positive integers. So we look at j equal to 1, 2, 3, and so on. We still take k and let k run through the integers. So you can see what we're doing here is we are throwing away a lot of the elements that are in this orthonormal basis, but it turns out that they can be replaced by something much easier. You see, going from this system to this system, I have thrown away all the elements we have here for j equal to 0, j equal to minus 1, j equal to minus 2, and so on, and still for k running through the integers. And it turns out that all these elements can be replaced by something much easier related to the function phi that we know, namely just the tk of phi where k runs through the integers. And of course, this is not trivial. It is by no means trivial that you can just take this orthonormal basis and replace by what is here. But this is one of the steps in the construction of the wavelet, one of the steps that I didn't go through for you. So this is something you will see if you look at proposition 8 to 5. So you see it here. So it is contained in, in the statement that you have as part three, that the functions tk5 and then t, uh, d to the power j tk psi 
they actually also form an orthonorm basis for L2 of R. So what we'll do now is to work with exactly that orthonorm basis. So now we have an orthonorm basis for L2 of R. That means we can take arbitrary functions in L2 of R and expand in terms of our orthonorm basis. So that means now we go back and now again we look at this key theorem that we have seen so many times and we look at exactly the expansion we get here. So we use, I think we, we need some space here. So we use our theorem 472. And what this says is that if you take any function f in the space, then it can be expanded in terms of our orthonorm basis. So what does the expansion say? It says we need to make a sum, and then inside the sum, we have all the coefficients, all the inner product between the f and the k element in the orthonorm basis times the k element in the orthonorm basis. So that means we have to do that for all the elements in the orthonorm basis. That means first we start with these elements, and then we continue with these elements afterwards. So what comes out when we look at tk5 is that we get the sum over k in c, the inner product between f and tk phi times tk phi. Now we ran through all the first elements in the orthonorm basis. Now we are missing the rest of the elements in the orthonorm basis. And these elements will then give the sum, and we have to make a sum over j in the natural numbers, positive natural numbers, and k in the integers. So this means j is running from 1 to infinity. And then we have the sum of k in c. And we get inner product between f and then the element in the orthonorm basis, which is d to the power j tk psi. And then again, the k element d to the power j tk psi. This is the expansion we get out. What are our conditions for this to be nice? First of all, let's look at what we have here. So again, think about what we spoke about in the first part of the lecture. We would like everything to be compactly supported. So the conclusion we had here is that we certainly would like the function phi to have compact support. This comes in very handy here as well, because the expansion we are looking at, it works for all functions in L2. But in real life, the signals we are dealing with, they will also have compact support because they will start at a certain time and they will finish at a certain time. So in real life applications, the function f will always have compact support. And the function phi is something we choose. So we will choose phi to have compact support. And this actually gives something very nice for the first part of the sum. It actually gives that this will be a finite sum automatically. And this is one of the exercises for you to check today. But the argument is that if the function f has compact support, say it has support here, and the function phi has also compact support somewhere here, then when we take, we look at the translates of phi, that means we are moving the function phi back and forth, then only a finite number of the k will actually overlap with the support for the function f. The rest of them will be somewhere outside here, and then the inner product will be equal to zero. So that means the compact support of these two functions, as you will see in the exercise, this implies that only a finite number of these coefficients are non-zero. So only a finite number of coefficients are non-zero, but this means exactly that this is actually a finite sum. So it's actually in one of the homeworks that you'll check this. So this is the exercise 8.4. So in practice, what is the problem for us will only be the last part, this double sum that we have here. We need to deal with this. So let's focus on this part. 
And instead of looking at this for arbitrary wavelet psi, let's look at it for the simplest psi that we can look at, namely the Haar wavelet. So let's make an example where we deal with, with the term we have here for the Haar wavelet. So the Haar wavelet, we saw already the picture of the function last week. So that was the one that took the value 1 on the interval from 0 to a half, and then it took the value minus 1 on the interval from a half to 1, and then it is 0 outside here. So this means this is psi of x equal to, and then we get 1 if x belongs to the interval from 0 to a half. And it is minus 1 if x belongs to the interval from a half to 1. And outside these two intervals, it is equal to 0. And as I said, this is exactly the way that you will work with today in the exercises. So you will look at exam exercise 8, 1. And you looked also at the, the first steps of that last week in the exercise 8, 2. So let's look at our, our expansion. So let's copy exactly what we have here. So I write down everything again. So we start with the f, and we take the expansion. So this is exactly what we have here. So this is the sum k in c, inner product between f, t, k, phi, t, k, phi. Of course, then you might ask yourself, what is the phi? And the phi is actually the function you, you worked with last week. So the phi is the characteristic function for the interval. Zero one, and then plus the sum j equal to one to infinity, sum k running through the integers, and then inner product between f t to the power j t k psi multiplied again with d to the power j t k psi. So now. As I say, the first sum is not a problem, so we already noticed that the first sum is just finite if the function f has, has compact support, because the function phi has compact support. This is just supported on 0, 1. So this is finite sum. If f has compact support. So let's look at the second part. So everything here, f equal to the sum, we get exactly the same for the first part. We do not change anything here. Then let's write down what we have for the second part. This is the sum j equal to 1 to infinity, the sum over k in c. So let's put in what this d to the power j t k psi, what this means. So then we get inner product between f, and this is equal to 2 to the power j half times the function psi evaluated at the point 2 to the j x minus k. You see there's a factor here, 2 to the power j half. I would like to take this out of the inner product. But you see, 2 to the power j half, this also appears when we write this out. So all together we get two of them. That means we get the factor 2 to the power j. And then what we get outside the inner product It's the same again. This is psi evaluated at 2 to the power j x minus k. So I think I should add a plus here. So actually what we have here is something we can write. Still, we don't change the first part. We can write it as the sum from j equal to 1 to infinity, sum 
K over C. And then you see that all what we have here will just be some numbers which depend on the J and on the K. So these will just be some numbers that we could call D, J, comma K. They have nothing to do with X because in this inner product we make the integration and X is the variable here. So at, this is just an outcome which is a number. It has nothing to do with X. The only place where X appears is in the function here. So this is D, J, K times Psi of 2 to the power J, X minus K. So let me write down the definition of these numbers, D, J, K. So the D, oops, D, J, K will be exactly 2 to the power J times the inner product between F psi to the 2 uh, to the power J X minus K. So let's write down what this means. This is the same as 2 to the power J. The inner product is the inner product on L2, so this is the integral from minus infinity to infinity, f of x, and then psi of 2 to the power j x minus k dx. And you know, in principle, we have to put a complex conjugation on, on the second part of the inner product, but this function is real. This is the way we have chosen it. This is just minus 1, 1, or 0. So this is a real function, so we don't need the complex conjugation. But let's write down what this is equal to. So psi 2 to the power j x minus k. We know that there are only three choices. It is 0, it is 1, or it is minus 1. But we need to find out exactly which x values will give us 1, which x values will give minus 1, and which x values will give 0. So what we can say is it is 1 if x belongs to, and now you see we have to put into the definition, it is 1 if the input belongs to the interval from 0 to a half. So that means this expression is 1 if 2 to the power j x minus k belongs to the interval 0 to a half. And in the same sense, it is minus 1 if the variable 2 to the power j x minus k belongs to a half to 1. And it is 0 if 2 to the power j x minus k does not belong to the interval 0 a half. But all of these conditions, we can change them. So they have something to do with the x instead. So when is the function equal to 1? This is the case if 2 to the power j x belongs to, and then we add k on this side. So 2 to the power j x has to belong to the interval from k up to k plus a half. This means that x has to belong to the same interval, but divided with 2 to the power j. That means x has to belong to the interval 2 to the minus j k up to k plus a half. And it is minus 1 if, and then we do the same operation, we take the k and add to the interval and we divide by the 2 to the power j. So x has to belong to 2 to the minus j and then we get the interval k plus a half up to k plus 1. And then it is 0 if x does not belong to 2 to the minus j k up to k plus 1. That means now we know exactly how this function looks like as a function of x. We know when is it equal to 1, when it is equal to minus 1, and when it is equal to 0. This means that we can put it into to this definition of the DJ, DJK. So djk will be the same as we have to take the integral from minus infinity to infinity, but we can do that by integrating over 
first this interval, where we can replace the function by 1. Then we integrate over this interval, where we can replace the function by minus 1. And then we integrate over the last part, where we can replace the function by 0. So what comes out is that from this expression, we get that d dk is the same as 2 to the power j. And here, we get an integral over this interval, which is the same as the integral over 2 to the minus j k up to, and 2 to the minus j, you can multiply it into the interval, so you get 2 to the minus j k for the beginning of the integral, and the endpoint is 2 to the minus j k plus a half. So on this interval, we get that we have to integrate f of x times the function psi. But on this interval, the interval we are dealing with here, the psi is exactly equal to 1, so we don't need to include this part. So this finish what happened when we integrate over this part. Then we also had to integrate over this part, but here the function is minus 1. That means if you continue the same way and write plus integral from 2 to the minus j, and then here we get times k plus a half up to 2 to the minus j k plus 1. Then again, we have to write f of x, but then we have to write the function value, which is now minus 1. So instead of writing minus 1 here, it is easier just to write dx, and then the minus 1, we take it out here, so we get a minus instead. Then we have taken care of this interval, and we have taken care of this interval, and on the rest, we see that the function psi is equal to 0. That means the rest of this interval from minus infinity to infinity does not contribute at all. So that means this is what we get out at the end. So now what I'm actually on the way to do is to solve one of your exercises for you. There's a long exercise today, exercise 8, 7, and the steps I'm taking here is actually part of that exercise. So now I will not do any more of that exercise. I'll just write down what you will show today based on what I did here. So what you will do in this exercise 8, 7, you will do some manipulations on these two expressions. And then you'll show that this is the same as the factor a half times the average of or f over a certain interval minus the average of f over another interval. So in other words, we get a half times the average. So the Danish word for this is gennemsnitsværdi. So we are speaking about gennemsnitsværdi of a function over a certain interval. Average of f over an interval that I call m j comma k, which is exactly the interval we are speaking about here, the interval from 2 to the minus j k up to 2 to the minus j k plus a half, which is again exactly the interval that we have here. So you get your value is the same as a half times the average of f over this interval minus the average over another interval. And these intervals are called m, j, k with a tilde. And these are exactly the next intervals. These are the intervals that you have here. So these are 2 to the minus j k plus a half up to k plus 1. This is the formula that we will use for applications of wavelets. So why is this formula interesting? This is what I would like to explain to you now. So first of all, let's look at the intervals that we are dealing with. Let's look at, at the intervals m, j, k, and m, j, k with a tilde.
So again, what I'm doing now is actually part of the exercise. So let's look at it for various values of the J. And if you are careful, if you look very careful on what I have on the board, we actually start with J equal to 1. So there's no need that I look at these intervals for J equal to 0. But I will look at it for J equal to 0, because then it's very easy to see the system in, in, the, in these intervals. So I look at J equal to 0, even though 0 actually does not appear. So if you look at J equal to 0, let's make an axis. And let's say that we have 0 here. Let's say that we have 1 here. And let's say that we have 2 here. So for j equal to 0, how does the interval mjk look like? This is the interval from 2 to the minus j, k up to k plus a half. So that means now we are looking at j equal to 0. So we get 2 to the 0. That means this factor will disappear. So that means the intervals we are looking at will just be intervals from an integer k up to k plus a half. So this means that the interval m0 comma 0. So the first 0 means that we have j equal to 0. And now we make a picture how it looks for k equal to 0. m0 comma 0, this is simply the interval going from 0 up to a half. So this is the interval going from here. This is the interval we are dealing with. And you don't need to think very much about whether the endpoint is included or not. This is not the key part, part here. But uh, it is open at this part. What about the corresponding interval m0, 0 with a tilde? You see, this is lining up right next to the same interval. Because then we get still that this factor is equal to, to 1. So we get the interval from k plus a half up to k plus 1. So this means this tilde interval is lining up right next to it. This is the interval from a half up to 1. And let's picture that with another color. What happens when we change the k? If we change the k from 0 up to 1, then you see this interval will go from 1 up to 1 and a half. That means the interval with the name m0, 1, this is the interval going from 1 up to 3 half. So that means this is the interval we get here. And then again, you have a corresponding m0, 1 with a tilde which is the interval from 3 half up to 2. So what you see is when you make a picture of all these intervals you're dealing with here, they actually form what is called a partition of the real numbers. The Danish word for partition is indeling. So we are making an indeling of the real numbers because we just take these intervals and they are lined up right next to each other and they cover the real axis like this. This is what happened for j equal to 0. Then let's look at what is really interesting for us, because our summation just starts with j equal to 1. So this is where the interesting, start, the interesting thing starts for us. So let's make the same figure again. Again, we have 2 here. We have 1 here. We have a half here. But for j equal to 1, you see you get exactly the same intervals. But you get a factor of a half in front of it. So that means in the past, we got the interval from 0 up to a half. Now you have a factor of a half in front of it. So you get an interval going from 0 up to 1 fourth. So that means we are making another splitting here. You're going from 0, and then you're going up to 1 fourth. And then you have the interval. Now the name is m. And the first index, which is the j, is now 1. And it is still with the k equal to 0. So this is the interval from 0 up to 1 fourth. So that's the one we have here. But again, you get that they're lining up next to each other. You get that m1, 0 with the tilde. This is the interval from 1 fourth up to a half. So that's the one we get here. And then it actually continues like this. So you get, again, a splitting here. You again get an interval, which is m1, 1. And you again get the next interval, which is m1, 1 with a tilde, and it continues like this. And you can already see how it goes. If you go to j equal to 2, you make another splitting again. So here we have the 1, and here we have a half. Here we have 
one fourth. We have zero, and we have one eight here. So we get some intervals. Here it will have the name m two comma zero. Here m two comma zero tilde, and so on. So we get that when we increase the j, we just get some intervals that are getting smaller and smaller. But no matter which j we are looking at, we get a partition of R. We get that these intervals are lining up next to each other and cover R. And what we know is that these coefficients dj, we are, dj k we are looking at, they are giving us a half times the average of f over an interval of this type minus the average over the next interval. So this means that the coefficients d, j, k, they are always given by this factor of a half, and then we take the average over an interval of this type minus the average over the next interval. This is what this formula tells us. How does this look like for concrete functions? So first, let's consider what I will call a smooth function. And what do I mean when I speak about smooth functions? So when I speak about smooth function in this context, it just means that the function is continuous, and we do, we do not want a function that oscillates all the time. So it's something that runs smoothly through the plane. So at least it should be continuous. And not too big oscillations. So the question is, if you're looking at a function of this type, so what I have in mind is a function that goes like something like this. And now you get the conclusion. And even though this is just four letters, these are the four letters that explain to you why wavelets will be a good idea. We want to look at the DJK. And you remember what wavelets does for us is that it gives us the expansion that is, you know, the expansion saying that all elements in the space can be written as the sum of elements in the orthonormal basis. And then what we have written now is that the coefficient in this expansion, they are given by exactly these coefficients, d, j, k. So these d, j, k are the coefficients that appear in our expansion in terms of the orthonormal basis. So of course, if you want to write down exactly how the function look like, you will need all coefficients. Because what the theorem tells us is that the function is exactly equal to this expansion that we get in terms of the orthonormal basis. But you also know that in real life, you cannot work with an infinite sum. You need somehow to truncate the infinite sum to a finite sum. And the way to do that is to take all small coefficients and throw them away. So what we would like to have in real life is that our function has an expansion where a lot of these coefficients are very small, because if they are small, we can throw them away. So now I ask you, what can we say about these coefficients d, j, k? Of course, you would need to look at them for all possible values of j, all possible values of k. But I would like to ask, what can you say about them if you look at d, j, k for large values of j? So large values of k, uh, sorry, large values of j does not mean that you need to go to j equal to 100. Actually, j equal to 10 or 15 is usually a large number in that context. So what can you say about the numbers d, j, k if j is a large number? And what you should look at 
is exactly this formula that we have for the coefficients d, d, k. And you should look at average over this interval minus average over this interval. So you should think about how these intervals look like. So whenever we increase the j, we are looking at averages over intervals of this type minus uh, average over neighbor intervals, but the intervals are getting smaller and smaller for large values of j. So what can we say about these numbers? Søren? They will be uh, very small because the uh, function does not vary very much over the uh, very small intervals to get for large j's. <coughs> so you say they will be almost equal to zero. And the reason is exactly as you say, that we are speaking about some intervals of this type, where this interval, now I need to make a, a big picture of this interval, but what this interval really means is that we are speaking about an interval that has the form m j comma k union with m j comma k tilde. And for large values of j, these intervals are extremely small. What actually happened is that this very small interval is getting split into the union of this interval and this interval. So what we have here is really the interval 2 to the minus j, and then we have k up to k plus a half, union 2 to the minus j, k, up, uh, k plus a half up to k plus 1. So for large values of j, these intervals are extremely small, and because the function does not oscillate very much, then when we are looking at a very small interval around the point x, then whether we take the average or a small interval to one side of the x or a small interval on the other side of the x, this will give more or less the same value. The, ver the difference between the errors or these two intervals will be very small. And what we are dealing with here is exactly errors over one of the intervals minus errors over the other one. This means what we have here will almost disappear. That means we get that the coefficients are almost equal to zero. And what this tells us is that we obtain a very efficient compression. If you take D, J, K, and we simply put it equal to zero for large J. Now, this more or less gives you the impression that you can throw away everything for large values of J. And this is actually not correct, because you see I have an assumption here. I assume that we are dealing with a smooth function. So now we are speaking about what happens at places where our function just goes smoothly, like this. So there's one issue that is remaining here, and that's the issue, what happens if our function makes a sudden jump? So we need to analyze that as well. And this is also what you will do today, but let's take some steps of it already now. So now we know what happens if the function is smooth, what happens at a point where the function is not smooth? So now, maybe we say that this is the first part, the assumption that the function is smooth. And the second part is, what happens if we are at a point where the function is discontinuous? So it turns out that if the function is discontinuous at x, we do not get an ex exact expression. Here we have a completely exact expression for the djk, but just the assumption that we have here does not mean that we can manipulate on this and get that this is exactly equal to something, but we can make some very good estimates on what it equals. So the situation is that we have the function that goes smoothly like this, and then suddenly there's a value of x, and at that point it makes a jump. It goes like this. So let's assume that this x is exactly one of the splitting points between this interval and this interval. It turns out that even if it is not exactly the splitting point, 
the argument is, is almost correct anyway. But let's, let's just take the splitting point. So let's assume that x is equal to exactly the splitting point. So this is 2 to the minus j times k plus a half. And let's assume again that this happens for some large value of j. Then you can actually tell almost exactly what happened with the d, j, k. So you see also here, we did not say it was exactly equal to zero. We put it equal to zero for the sake of compression, but we just say it was almost equal to zero. So it's the same now. We look at it, we look at the size of it, and I claim that if you look at this expression, you can get a very good estimate for what is the absolute value of the DJK. Alexander? That's true. So again, just the formula that we have here tells us that the absolute value of d, j, k is the same as the absolute value of the average over this interval minus the average over this interval. And then we still have this factor, a half in front of it. But this is a very small interval. So the average over this very small interval, what is this almost equal to? Yes, Alexander? No, because the value of the endpoint could, could be here, but no, it is the, like the limit, the limit when we approach from this side, because we are taking the average over this small interval, and because this interval really is very small for large values of j, this is almost the same as just what we call the f evaluated at the point, but we take the limit from, from the left side, so this is f with a minus, and then we subtract the average over this interval, which in the same sense is almost the same as f of x plus. And then we have to take the absolute value of this. So this means that what we saw as the first part is that if you are looking at these coefficients corresponding to j and k, where we have intervals where the function is smooth, then the coefficients djk are almost equal to zero. We can just put them equal to zero. But if you are looking at j and k, corresponding to places where the function has a jump, then the coefficients are not disappearing. Then no matter how large we are going with the j, we will get some big coefficients. That means if you make a wavelet analysis of the functions and we just look at all these coefficients d, j, k, then we can just look at where are the large coefficients. And if the large coefficients appear for all values, big values of j, then we know there's a place where the function is discontinuous. I think I need to show you a picture. So actually, I was planning to do it next week, but I'll do it today. So why does this work in practice? So let's think about what you did 15 years ago. You were sitting in kindergarten, and you made some pictures. I know exactly how your picture looked like. And at that time, you didn't know about Mathematics 4 yet, so you were very optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> but you also knew that there could be something that was not so nice all the time. So there were some clouds as well. So this is just a typical picture. I will make just one very small change to this picture. Let's just assume that there's a, a fence behind the house. So that means maybe we have a gray house, we have a brown tree, of course, and then we have a gray fence. And you know, Image analysis is always done the way that you, you split this picture into a lot of pixels. So you have maybe 256 pixels here, you have 256 pixels down here, and then you analyze it row by row. So let's just analyze the row that we have here. So the way you should think about this line is that this line corresponds exactly to more or less the function that we have here and the function that we have here. What does this mean? It means that when we want to find out what image we are dealing with, we are looking at the variations in color here. So that means 
we are saying that here it is the fins, so this is more or less gray. So that means if you look at um, a color scale where, for example, we say that if it is white, it corresponds to the value zero. If it is completely black, it corresponds to the value 100. Then we say if this is gray, then it means that on the first part, we get some pixel values, color values, that are something like this. Then we hit the brown tree. This will change the, the value of the color. So it goes up to something like this. And then we finish the tree. We go down to the fence again. It continues like this. And then we hit the house. And let's say that this is rose, which will be some kind of gray color at the end. So maybe this gives something like that is going here. And then after that, again, we end up at the fence. So this is the function we are looking at. This is the function we are analyzing right now. So we are representing this function in terms of an also known basis and in terms of all these coefficients d, j, k. We want, all, we want a lot of these coefficients to be small. So let's say that we really have 256 pixels on this row. So when we do this wavelet representation, we represent our line in the image using this coefficients d, j, k. What happens when we look at large values of j? How many of these coefficients will be interesting? How many of them will be large? Matthias? Four. Yes, for this row, it will be four. One, two, three, four. There will be four big values. The rest of them will be very close to zero. That means instead of having 256 pixels here with 256 different values, and we have to store these 256 values, then what we have to do is really to store these four values where something happened in the picture. The rest of them we can put to zero, and this gives the, the compression rate. So in practice, what comes out here is that actually 90% of the, of the coefficients can be thrown away. And actually, the algorithm is even more efficient than that, because what the wavelet people do is they make, they make a wavelet analysis on each of the row. And if, after they have done that, they do the same on the columns. <laughs> so that means they actually do two wavelet analysis right after each other, and then they get an even better compression like that. So if you think about what we have done mathematically, then you can really understand why it will work on images like this. The real surprise comes when you're looking at much more complicated pictures. And uh, I will speak a little bit more about that next week. But what I have explained here really does not explain why it also works for fingerprints. I mean, there are so much. I mean, this is, this is you cannot see it yet. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> these fingerprints, they are so complicated. So you cannot just by, by looking at them say that the idea that we have here also works for fingerprint. But this is what happened in real life, that if you take a wavelet that is better than the wavelet we're dealing with today, then even for very complex pictures like this one, you get a compression rate of about 90%. So this tells you something about why wavelets are interesting. It is 3 o'clock now, so you need to go and do the exercises. I promise you, next lecture, I will start again by maybe put a little bit more details in this example and also give you one more application. So see you at the problem session. <laughs>